Please welcome President and Chief Executive Officer of ITC Holdings, Linda Apsey. Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer of AAM, David Doughty. Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Our Next Energy, Muji Vijabs. And to moderate the discussion, host of AutoLine, John McElroy. Well, I know we're, we're about to lose half our audience here, but that's okay. We're going to talk about the topic that is dominating the automotive industry right now, and that's this move to electric vehicles. Is the industry going to be able to make that conversion? Is Michigan going to play a proper role in it? And are consumers even going to buy these electric cars? Uh, Linda, as you know, uh, the question I get asked the most is, what about the grid? What if everybody plugs in and the whole thing goes down? Where's that going to leave us? You uh, uh, work with high voltage transmission lines. I mean, you're as close to the infrastructure of the grid as we get on this panel right now. How do you see it? Yeah, John, I think that is the question of the day is, you know, is the grid, is the grid ready and capable of handling it all? And look, I think there's a, a perspective perhaps on both sides, right? I mean, first of all, as a, as a utility um, we have to keep the lights on, right? It's reliability. And so, you know, I think everybody, you know, has to recognize that, you know, the energy industry in and of itself is going through a massive transformation as we retire uh, fossil units, build more and more renewables. Um, at the same time, more and more dependency on reliability, resiliency, and obviously, you know, you know now electrification. And so this huge transformation that's going on um, certainly keeps us up at night. Um, but I would say, look, the good news is, you know, there's a lot of action and activity in our business, high voltage transmission. Never before has our business, you know, been sort of in the spotlight in terms of the needs uh, for significant investment in transmission infrastructure, not just here in Michigan, but nationwide. The last time, um, you know, our piece of the business, uh, you know, saw a major build out was back in the 1970s, right, commensurate with... Um, um, air conditioning load. And so now we're at this, at this sort of our next juncture. And, you know, look, I would say, you know, we are uh, heavily involved um, there. You know, we belong to regional transmission organizations uh, that are making, you know, I would say some pretty aggressive assumptions, uh, both around, uh, you know, new uh, generating resources that are necessary, as well as assumptions for load forecasts that do recognize, you know, kind of EVs you know, right now, right, I think studies would, would suggest that by 2030, you know, increase in electrical demand from EVs alone um, is anywhere from 8 to 13% to higher. That's significant. In our business, that is huge and that's significant. So I think from a transmission perspective, um, you know, it takes a long time to build transmission. It's getting harder and harder to build it, uh, citing permitting issues, opposition. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, I think from a transmission perspective, uh, because it is so high voltage, certainly there is a certain amount of sort of capacity available on the grid. Uh, but at some point, there's going to be a tipping point. Um, and I think that's the concern is, when does that tipping point occur? You know, where do the EVs and the electrification, where does it show up on the grid? Um, what are the local impacts? Because there's sort of a local up impact and there's sort of a supply down impact. Uh, but first and foremost, right, we've got to keep the lights on. And it's, you know, we're, you know, we'll have made a lot of progress, I think, over the course of the next decade. Uh, but I do think local. Got it. And uh, we'll come back to more of that. But I want to get others in on this. Majib, I mean, you're a glory story for the state of Michigan. You've got a battery startup that you're doing yourself. But stick with the grid for a minute. I mean, your, your batteries are going to rely on the grid. I'm sure you've studied this issue. How do you see it? I think we, <clears throat> we see an opportunity, John, for batteries uh, to help level the demand as well as create supply. As you think about now generation having a time base where generation can be related to solar, wind, and other uh, technologies that are being developed around the world, specifically what we see in battery technology is that we can help levelize the capabilities of businesses as well as the electric vehicle consumers where their supply and demand doesn't have to be time-based, but rather we can uh, move energy around. So your battery company will not just be for electric cars, you're going to do battery storage for uh, utilities as that, well? That's exactly right. We, we, you know, there's a chemistry that's been 
known for about a decade to work in both automotive and grid. Where it has been in the grid uh, iron phosphate, uh, it has a, a long life, a low cost, an abundant supply of raw materials, namely iron is not a questionable material. It's very abundant. We got it in the UP. <laughs> but mostly it's got the safety associated with, a safety track record associated with uh, long lasting, very safe and durable. What we're doing in uh, Our Next Energy is we're making that battery chemistry functionally work and match the range of some of the other chemistries that have been traditionally used in automotive. So now that we can do that, we can have factories that build batteries for both transportation and grid. And that really does help us with costs, improves our efficiency, gets us into multiple markets, and gets more, more than one market uh, in the same factory, which helps the factory then not have the risk of one market having a downturn and not having the ability to then uh, maintain utilization. David, you're in a company or run a company your father started, really uh, very internal combustion engine dependent, prop shafts, drive shafts, and the like. As you look out over this transition, what do you see going on from two standpoints? Is there a role for you to play in electric vehicles? And secondly, I'm, I'm very pro EV. I, I, I think it's the future. I totally believe in it. I don't think the internal combustion engine for many applications is going away anytime soon. So what role does your company play in this transition as a traditional ice-based kind of a supplier? And what do you think the, the take rate for EVs is going to be? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? Uh, no, it's, it's a hundred billion dollar yeah, right. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, to answer your first question, absolutely, we're going to be relevant in the electrified world. It's just a matter of back to your other question, what's the adoption rate? When you look at, there's 1.2 billion uh, ICE vehicles or internal combustion vehicles globally in the world today. 284 million of those are right here in the U.S. or in North America. Um, you know, and when you look at uh, global EVs, there's only 10 million uh, as of 2022. Now, that's up from you know, a million in 2017 and 100,000 in 2012. So electrification's here. It's, it's only going to grow, uh, and a lot of it's going to, and we were hoping it was going to be based on what the consumer's desires were. But at the same time now, governments are regulating what's going to take place, especially in Europe and especially in, in, uh, in China. That's where it started, but it's also now here under the Biden administration with the aggressive rules that are put into place. We, we have to adapt or die is what we have to do. Um, the good news for our company is we made investments, and we are the pioneers of disconnecting all-wheel drive systems back in the day, but we also started making electric all-wheel drive assist systems and started working on battery electric systems back in the 210, 212 period of time. The problem was the market wasn't ready for our t the technology. We sold our first program in 2015. We launched it in 2017. That was with Jaguar with the iPACE program. It was our first uh, high production volume electric vehicle. So we have the experience. It's probably the most complicated product we've ever made. We've migrated now to working with Mercedes and AMG. Uh, we just launched a big variant for them last year. We had six additional variants coming off of that. And then we took our technology over to China because those were the two big markets, Europe and China initially. Uh, but 75% of our business is right here in North America with the Detroit 3. And they were a little bit slow to get on board, but they're 100% on board now. You've seen the big commitment of Ford Motor Company, over 50 billion of investment towards EVs. General Motors, well over 35 billion of investment. When you look at the total investment that's going to take place in the EV space between now and 2030, it's globally. And about 300 uh, billion of that will be in, in North America or in, in the U.S. So call it roughly 25%. Uh, we just got to do our part, uh, and, uh, and we are. And um, so we just won a big contract with Stellantis here recently. Uh, I can't announce the program, but I can say it's front and rear beam axles, and it's sizable, so it's significant to us. Uh, but it also proves that our technology is uh, validated and also proves that we're going to be relevant going forward. Um, I still believe that ICE engines uh, in, the, in the North American market will be here much longer, especially because of the type of vehicles that we drive, that being larger vehicles, pickups, SUVs, crossover vehicles. Um, but make no mistake, electrification's here, and it's only going to grow in, in demand as we go forward. Okay, and I'm going to throw this out to the panel, so whoever uh, goes first goes first. Everyone I talk to is like, where am I going to plug in? And... Yeah, you can plug in at home. That's the brilliant way to do it, right? But if you're out on the road, out and about, people want to know, 
where am I going to plug in? And what about all these stories I read about when you pull into these public charging stations and they don't work? What do you tell people? Yeah, I, I, I'll take the first shot at it. Um, you know, when you, when, you think, you know, when you talk to the consumer and read about what the consumer's concerns are right now, the first issue is range anxiety. Second issue is charging, to your point. And the third is affordability. So what do we need to do to address those issues? And Majib can speak better in regards to you know, the, the range issue as far as the battery technology. But you know, at a minimum, they need, you know, we need 300 miles uh, per charge for people to feel comfortable about that. And quite honestly, I think we need more than that based on how I got educated yesterday from Majib in regards to some co coefficient of uh, forces and drag and all. Um, but, but then the other issue is the charging systems. Right now, we only have 130,000 charging systems in the US. Based on the forecast, based on the prognosticator's uh, forecast by 2030, we would need to have, we would need to have 1.2 million. The Biden administration is trying to put in and, and has donated or uh, dedicated 7.5 7 7 billion towards charging stations, um, of which 500, 5 billion of that's towards you know, um, um, uh, highway, uh, fast charging stations, the other 2.5 two billion towards more remote areas. Um, so we, we need to put the charging stations in because it's a, a level of confidence that the consumer needs. But when it's all said and done, the whole thing is going to come down to affordability. And can the mass markets really afford to buy this? And, and to do that, they can't afford to buy a vehicle that was $66,000, meaning an electric vehicle, the average price of an electric vehicle was $66,000 at the end of last year. It's $55,000 uh, at the beginning of this year because Tesla dropped their prices 20%. Uh, but, the, but it was for other reasons. They were pushing volume versus you know, profitability at, at the point in time. But, uh, Majib, I don't know if you want to speak on the battery side as far as the range and yeah, I, anxiety. Uh, very, very clear summary that you gave, and I agree with your points precisely. Uh, on the range topic, when I started my job in electric vehicle back in the early 90s, we set a target of 100 miles. We made a clear idea that um, it wasn't 100 miles. It was 700 miles a week because you could recharge every night at home you know, kind of like try to reprogram the way the consumers think. And it's true that the consumers are not using hundreds of miles of range every day, but there is a barrier to making a decision to buy an electric vehicle based on an occasional occurrence. And that occasional occurrence, if you now look at the data around that number, it's right around 285 miles is every single American's experiencing uh, an event that's in their mind that they must have a product that can satisfy. That's where the 300 mile range of electric vehicles has started the market. But then you get into trucks and SUVs and you rightly point out that is the market in the United States. And when you take a truck or an SUV on a road trip, you can lose about a third of its range, rated range, in driving that road trip normally, whether it's you know, hill climbing or winter or 80 miles per hour, you can lose about a third of that rated range, which means that there's still a deficit. So what we've done in uh, our thinking is product roadmap wise, is we set the bar at doubling today's range. 600 miles on rated basis is, in our opinion, the right number to then overcome all of those obstacles. And now we're chartering a course with sustainable chemistries, better raw materials, better safety, and targeting that 600 mile range target. That's the company mission that we've set out. And if we can accomplish that, it doesn't mean that we don't need charging infrastructure because even if you look at the landscape of charging infrastructure, there's something known as a charging um, infrastructure uh, desert. It's the areas that are rural enough that not enough people are drawing charging infrastructures into those areas. Then you're like hesitant to buy an electric car because you can't just go anywhere. And so in the context of it, we have to deal with the charging desert, which is rural population. We have to then also create frequency of people just know that they'll run into a charger often enough that they don't have to worry about the long lines forming on July 4th weekend. That's the other problem. You get charging infrastructure, but then if you get there and you have to wait two hours to charge, that's not a good experience, and I've had that happen to me before. So I think it's definitely need, the infrastructure needs to be developed, but longer range electric vehicles up to 600 miles will overcome a big obstacle in everyone's mind. To go from like low levels of adoption to full market adoption, we're gonna to have to push forward on technology. Look, you can get 600 miles of range. You just put in a bigger battery, but can I afford it? Yeah, so your point about affordability goes into another point that I think is gonna happen in the industry, that electric vehicles are going to last longer. Their residual value is going to be better. And that's also a very important factor in the affordability of a product. 
Uh, you know, Mackinac Island is a good, great place to use this example. We all love boating here in Michigan, but we don't buy boats on five-year loans. We buy them on 20-year loans. Why is a boat given a 20-year loan? Its depreciation is a different level. If you think about an electric car at a 10-year depreciation level, that can also change the affordability. And I don't think the battery needs to be physically bigger. It's the same size battery. It doesn't even need to be more expensive in the sense that we, we are also forced into a, an equation in automotive that says, let's satisfy the full equation with raw materials, better materials, lower cost. And as you create scale, you'll start driving that cost down. I think we're going to get batteries under $10,000 that meets 600 mile range. That's the kind of goal that I have in my mind. And if we can push forward to those goals, then we are creating a product that with a slightly different financing strategy could meet the market's full needs without any affordability problem at all. So Majeev, yesterday we were talking, you were talking about what it takes to be parity with a gasoline engine yeah. from a battery technology. Just share that with the audience. Yeah, it's $80 per kilowatt hour. If you're at that level, you look at the content of battery and motor and the total powertrain, um, and we're right around $130 per kilowatt hour with nickel cobalt batteries. I think iron-based batteries are going to hit $100 per kilowatt hour without very large difficulty. And the passage of the IRA, I think we do have line of sight to get below $100 per kilowatt hour even today. At that point, we're within the decade of scaling up the supply chain here in North America. I think that we'll see our ability to like, lower that cost structure but we need a massive scale to do it. That's also the, the equation that has to get started is um, avoid the hesitation of deployment of infrastructure, uh, continue to invest in local supply chain, and then U.S. car companies using U.S. battery companies. That's a very important concept as well. Yeah, well, look, uh, the powertrain experts that I talk to are saying 2026, 2027 is when we're going to see the crossover point where BEVs will be cheaper to manufacture than EVs. Of course, it varies about, you know, with the size of the battery, the vehicle, and the like, but that's the time frame that they're talking about. But I want to get back to uh, the grid and public charging, and L Linda, let's get some of your input on that. Where do you see it going? Yeah, look, I mean... And how quickly? <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, from, the, from an energy, you can call it energy policy perspective, you always want diversity of supply, and you want diversity in demand, right? And, you know, I think a lot of us think, well, everybody's just going to charge their car at home in their garage at night. You know, right now, when you think of our business, right, we build our transmission grid or distribution grids to be able to accommodate the peak demand. So the hottest summer day, our infrastructure is built to accommodate the load, the demand, and, and that's how we think, that's how we size our infrastructure. And if you think about what you hear a lot in our businesses, you know, well, we're going to shift to, you know, time of day pricing, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to move people from charging, for example, away from the peak period, 4 to 7 p.m., to the evenings, right? Because that's when we have more capability, more capacity available on the grid. But if you think about, well, everybody's just now going to plug in at home, then you've shifted when your peak is going to occur. And if you think about, you know, where this country's heading with renewable resources, right? I mean, think about it, step back in it. When does the wind blow? During the day. When does the sun shine? During the day. So in theory, if we're going to move to time of day pricing, right, you want people to plug in during the day because that's when the, it's free, right? It, it doesn't, you know, you obviously get the fixed cost of the assets, but the actual resource is free. But we don't have a grid today that it can accommodate that. And well, so that we, comes back to Mujib's uh, battery does, storage, absolutely, right? and that's an important part of the, you know, of, of the equation. But ultimately, at the end of the day, right, in our business, right, as, as sort of load demand curve shift, as supply shifts, um, you know, we have to think about, and there's going to be a lot of, and I know Majib can talk about this in a lot more detail, a lot of load management techniques, right, where you're basically going to have computers that optimize when you charge. But to do that, we have to have a broad network of charging so that people can charge throughout the day. They can charge during peak hours. They can charge at night, um, and we're a long, long way from that. And so and that, um, you know, from our perspective, right, trying to figure out, you know, kind of where is that charging going to show up, when is it going to show up, how much, how fast, what's the adoption rate. Um, you know, look, ultimately, we're going to get there. Um, I think it's a matter of the course of the next decade. Um, what are the impacts going to be? And certainly, you know, in my business, we talk about the power of and, right? It's 
you know, as we think about reliability, resiliency, and you know, uh, you know, moving towards clean energy and EVs, and its affordability. And you know, a big question remains, you know, how much are consumers willing to absorb to accommodate the transition that's going on in the supply end of the equation as well as the demand end of the equation. Well, if they can make some money doing it, I think yeah. they'll be I mean, interested. Absolutely, yeah. And that brings Bring us them. to yeah. bidirectional charging. And uh, I, I'd love to get you talking about that, Majid, because we, we talked a bit uh, about that yesterday. But um, uh, I'll leave one little, start with one little anecdote. Bidirectional charging is when, sure, you plug your car in at home and you charge your battery, but if the electricity goes down, you can run your house on the electricity in your battery from your car. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time, what, what if a hurricane comes? What if a tornado comes? And, and the grid goes down, uh, you know, what am I going to do with my car? And I remind them, well, number one, if there's no electricity, the pumps at the gas station don't work either. Yeah, right. So your ice may have a problem getting out of the danger zone. And I say, tell them, you know, look, if a hurricane's coming, you're going to know in advance, you know, our, our weather prediction's pretty good. You're going to charge up the battery and you're going to plug your car into your house. And depending on the size of the battery, you're going to run your house for days, maybe even a week. But I'd love you to pick that up, Majib, because I know you've studied this far more than anyone else. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think the exciting future that we're headed towards is that electrification is about mobility and batteries, but it's also about buildings and batteries. Then it goes into charging stations will likely start adopting some level of energy storage right in the charging station, because ultimately it's the movement of energy around and levelizing the time of day use that's going to make it very efficient. So we think of a vehicle pulling up to a building as it just needs to charge. It's a cost to the consumer. It's charging from the building. That's kind of the design of today's infrastructure. But if you fast forward five to 10 years, I think that's going to be a bi-directional relationship. I think the consumers are going to make a choice in software that a third of my battery, I'm willing to sell energy <clears throat> while the vehicle is hooked up to a building. Anytime I'm hooked up to a building and the building needs energy to levelize its load, I'm willing to sell that energy. And the buildings are likely to pay good money for that energy because they're trying to solve a problem to avoid some kind of peak power demand problem. And the utilities like that because it, levels, it levelizes smaller nodes for buildings because they're getting their peak power out of all the users that are connected. <clears throat> and in that scenario, the battery is monetized. And if a consumer is buying an electric car that can earn itself money, even if it's small, even if it's $10, $20 a day, if at the end of the month you got $300 worth of uh, return on investment because your vehicle battery was being leveraged for solving a, a utility scale storage topic at a building level in your business, that is a great reason for workplaces to offer charging because they're connecting more people. That's the reason why charging infrastructure gets deployed faster in the business place but today's vehicle does not typically do bidirectional charging. The moment that's enabled, then you can do that at home as well, and you can do that across your neighborhood. So you can locally power neighborhoods. And think about that in a developing country where the cities have electricity and the villages don't. Well, the, maybe the vehicles are transporting and creating local area networks to create their own grid. And I think in the future, mobility and batteries and connecting to the rest of the buildings that they're uh, interfacing with, bi-directional charging and discharging makes a ton of sense. So great little story. There is a school system in Massachusetts and another one in New Hampshire. They each got a couple of electric school buses. And what do school buses do all summer long? They sit parked unused. So the school districts made deals with their local utilities using this bi-directional charging. Uh, the schools would buy the electricity at low demand, low cost, and they would sell it back to the utility at high demand, high cost. They made $10,000 a bus over a three month period. And now they're very excited about, because during the school year, what do buses do? They're busy from roughly seven o'clock to nine o'clock every morning and three to five in the afternoon. And then they just sit. So there's a real opportunity to make money on it. And that's where I think a lot of the change in people's thinking about maybe I can be ready for electric, but David, I'd like to get your thought. I mean, you watch the automotive market. You, you've got a good sense of what consumers want. Uh, the Biden administration would like to see 50% EV adoption by 2030. 
Uh, the EPA has just come out with uh, proposed new emission regulations that would force maybe a 62% EV adoption rate by 2032. What's your thoughts? How do you think it's going to go? Well, I think it's going to be based on what we just talked about. It's going to be paced by, is the grid there? Is the battery technology there? No, I want a prediction. 2030, what do you 20, think the tank 20, rate's going to be? Okay. <laughs> I, 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 pers yeah. I personally think it'll cap out uh, between 30 and 40% penetration. Uh, by 2030. By 2030 period of time. Yeah. And then ICE will be the balance of the vehicles until the rest of the infrastructure gets put into place. And even after that, though, I mean, uh, you know, Jim Farley likes to talk about somebody with an expedition, with a fifth-wheel trailer, pulling horses in Montana. You ever see that going electric? Uh, I, I, no, I see more hydrogen and other types of okay. applications okay. coming into place for those, those, okay. those requirements. Linda, you're on the spot now. Where, how, yeah, what do you think I, the take rate's gonna, going to be? I, I agree. I think it's going to be around 30% by 2030. Look, in our business, you know, transmission is at the center of this transformation. And, you know, on average, it takes us seven years to build major transmission infrastructure. Why? In Why so long? It's big. It's huge. you got to get landowner. you got to buy land. You have to go through regulatory approvals, siting. You know, and it's just these are big, long line, 100 mile 300 mile lines, it just it takes time. And so if it takes on average six, seven years to build a major, just one line, major piece of infrastructure, this is going on all across the country. Let's talk about supply chain, you know, uh, challenges, labor challenges. Um, I just don't think, um, you know, anything above, you know, 30, 35%, uh, as, as Dave, I think, articulated that the grid will be able to handle it. Does it have to take that long? And, you know, I, I'm thinking automotive-wise, you know, here's Ford Motor Company building what is essentially a whole new Rouge plant down in Tennessee. It's a massive, massive facility. Not going to take them anywhere near that long to build it is what it's, you're talking about for... Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think it comes back to, right? I mean, you think about all of the different stakeholders involved in this conversation and, and the power of and. And, yeah, I think we need to be doing a lot more, you know, from, a, you know, the, the automotive manufacturers, the utility industry government, you know, other private uh, industries to, to solve this and to, you know, put our stake in the ground about where are, where, where are we really going to be and realistically, how can we get there? Because if we don't, you know, we're, we're, setting, we're, we're not going to be pacing. We're not going to be at the same pace. Um, and, you know, it's, that's going to be a cost to consumers as well. And so I, you know, I think the more that we can uh, work together to, you know, drive uh, sort of stakes in the ground about where we want to be when with real, realistic goals and objectives, um, I think we'll be much farther ahead. I think failure, failure would be the worst outcome. Failure is not an option. Failure is not but, but an John, option. John, there's, there's capacity on the grid today to accommodate electric vehicles up to a certain point. It's the incremental part that, that Linda's talking about that's going to take some time and all the permitting and all the, the things that are required. And, you know, GM is trying to achieve 1 million units of electric vehicles by 2025. Ford's trying to accomplish 2 million by the 2026 period of time. Part of that will be satisfied by the existing grid. But at the same time, the grid's not a smart grid today. In some, some states it is. In California it is. But not in Michigan and not a lot of here in the Midwest. Well, look, you know, the grid's got to be upgraded irrespective of yeah. EVs especially from a cyber standpoint. It's got to be hardened. But back to putting people on the spot, Mujib. Yeah. What do you think by 2030 the take rate for electrics will be? Yeah, I, I would go higher, and I'll tell you why I think that. Um, I think it's uh, around 50%. And the reason I think it's around 50% is that we are in a period unlike any other of investment in energy storage. We've never had this kind of investment flow, and we've never had the, the might of the U.S. government get behind energy storage in the way that they are right now. Last year, before IRA, 60% of new generation capacity was based around renewable energy. If you look at all of the renewable energy generation going on right now, it's not paired with battery yet, which will help make it more effective. We are investing in battery factories to help make the grid more effective, but also then it lowers the cost to make automotive more effective. And then the final piece of the equation is, I think the rate of adoption of electric vehicles will accelerate once this range anxiety gets lifted. For sure. And I think way before 2030, companies will be producing technologies that start enabling the four to 600 mile band, which is the next band of adoption 
At 600 miles, I don't think people will question that anymore. And at the point that that happens, the adoption rate will take on, just like cell phones, we all remember back to having a flip phone and having like a normal type of screen. And then all of a sudden, smartphones would start, start coming out. It looked like an expensive version of a phone until it became a new tool. When it became a new tool, it was business necessary. It was everything you needed, including now apps that created functional capability, just like batteries can create functional capability, yet you can earn revenue from your vehicle, then it takes a whole different uh, setting. So I think the business model is evolving quickly, and we're in a period of growth fueled by uh, the might of the U.S. government now getting behind it. And I'm more hopeful that it's uh, the number's higher I'm glad the number's at least 35%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would go a little higher. You'd expect a battery guy to say yeah, it's yeah. going to be higher, right? <laughs> and then no self-interest involved. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so a quick little anecdote. It was two years ago you guys did a demo. You're, you're based in Novi, right? Yeah, that's right. So they, they gutted uh, the battery out of uh, a Tesla. What Was it a 3? Model S. Yeah. Model S. Put his advanced battery in it. Drove from Novi up here to Mackinac. Turned around. Went back to Novi and still had to drive around for like 20, 30 minutes, right, to, to use up the charge that you had there. Yeah. So yeah. Very, <laughs> this is what he's talking about, of what's possible in the near future. Right. Look, we're down to the last couple of minutes. I, I need some quick closing thoughts, but now I want to specifically look in where does Michigan stand and how are we poised and what else do we need to do? And I know very little time to do that, but Linda, we'll start with you. Yeah, look, from, I think from a, a transmission infrastructure perspective, I think Michigan is poised well. I mean, I think both from the performance reliability perspective of its transmission grid, um, obviously the future plans for investment. So from a, from a transmission perspective, um, I feel Michigan's very well poised. However, um, I think as, as Dave uh, indicated earlier, it's, it's all about the adoption rate and then what are the local impacts um, and where do those show up and when do those show up? Yeah. David? Well, listen, the, the assembly structure is set, you know, here in the state of Michigan or in the Midwest for the Detroit theory as we know it. Um, but, but as most of the international companies are coming here, they're putting their tech centers in Michigan because of the uh, engineering talent and the, and the skill sets that we have here. But most of their assembly plants are going south of the Mason-Dixie, right? So that's a, that's a challenge um, for us to compete for new assembly plants here. Um, our grid need, needs improved and, and, and structured. The charging stations are way behind. The one big thing that I think is going to be a limiting factor here, too, is it's a national security issue. Is where is all the raw materials coming that go into batteries today? And yes, the Biden administration wants to have it localized here. But again, just like Linda was saying, it's, it's going to take time to open up mines, get the mines going, and, and providing the type of material, unless there's a change in technology that re requires us to be less dependent on rare earth metals. I think it's um, clear in the near future that workforce development and attracting eager, passionate, uh, hopeful workers into battery factories, and these are different types of factories than traditional automotive assembly, I think that we want a, a program that spurs the imagination of the future workforce, even at the high school level. I'm looking forward to that. I want to see that we start creating a coalition of willing uh, industrial partners and academic uh, universities and even high schools to participate in developing a program that make going to high school and the outcome going into a great uh, tech job in a battery factory as just as successful as an outcome as going to college. Because if we're going to go back to the base roots of industrial revolution, we need to create workforce that's so excited about that being their future opportunity that we make that cool. And I, I want to see that we work on that. I want to touch on one thing that David uh, just brought up, national security, and why this is so important and goes beyond the automotive industry. Uh, and I learned this from the CTO of CATL, an American who is the CTO of the biggest China, 18 pounds of batteries as part of their gear. Communication, night vision, radio, blah, blah, blah. Where do you think most of those batteries come from? They come from okay. China. And if the batteries were not made in China, the materials in them were processed in China. So it goes beyond automotive. It's something that this country has got to get on board with. Right. Absolutely. But with that, we'll leave you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, but especially applause for my panel. Yeah. Good job.